I don't care what you call it. I'm his mother. I know it was he was murdered. He was murdered. He was not hit by a car. He was murdered. He was beaten to death. And I've seen his pictures and why? Why? What gave you the right to take my son from me? On the previous episode, we took a look at the Murdoch family and the fatal shooting of Maggie and Paul Murdoch that rocked the state's low country region, where the family had established its legal dynasty. At the time of his death, Paul Murdoch, the son who was killed, had made plenty of enemies, and at the time was out on bail after being charged in 2019 with drunkenly crashing a boat in an accident that killed one of his passengers. 19-year-old Mallory Beach. In the low country, crews searching the waters off of Beaufort County for a missing teenager say they aren't giving up hope and are still giving it 100%. 19-year-old Mallory Beach hasn't been seen since a boat she and five friends were riding in hit a piling in Archer's Creek on Sunday morning. A helicopter... Paul Murdoch was indicted and charged with three felony counts of boating under the influence, including causing the death of Mallory Beach and seriously injuring two other passengers. At the time of his death, Two years had passed after charges were filed, and there still had not been a trial date set. The Beach family had brought a wrongful death suit, which is currently proceeding against the company who sold alcohol to Paul, his father Alec, and his older brother, Richard Alexander Jr., known as Buster, whose ID Paul allegedly used that day. Civil conspiracy and outrage are the official claims by Mallory Beach's family. In all, eight people and businesses are named in the complaint, which details an intent and ulterior motive to harm the family and affect the civil lawsuit the Beaches have filed against Parkers. They have also filed a $50 million creditors claim in Colton County, South Carolina's probate court against the estates of Paul Murdoch and his late mother, Maggie. Boat crash survivors Morgan Dowdy and Molly Altman also have filed creditors' claims against the Murdoch's estate for $10 million and $5 million, respectfully, online probate records show. Rumors began to circulate in the Low Country region that Paul was the main target in the double homicide, and Maggie had paid the ultimate price for her son. In a TV interview, Paul's uncle revealed that his nephew had received plenty of death threats. I didn't think it was a credible threat. If it was, I would have tried to do something or notified someone. But I guess, you know, maybe I made a mistake. So was this a revenge for the death of Mallory Beach? This answer would be no. Law enforcement and sources familiar with the murder inquiry had reported that the agency had worked hard to exclude multiple people from the case, including the four survivors of the 2019 boat crash, as well as Mallory Beach's family. According to sources, all of the boat crash survivors and Beach family members voluntarily submitted to questioning and volunteered to provide their DNA as a part of the double homicide investigation. A source close to the family said the Beaches have not been questioned again since providing their statements and DNA. So, if it wasn't the victims and families of the boat crash, who else would want the Murdoch family dead? Well, a few weeks after the murders of Maggie and Paul, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division announced that newly uncovered information for the Murdoch's investigation has led them to reopen, at the time, a six-year-old cold case surrounding a 19-year-old named Stephen Smith. 52-year-old Maggie Murdoch and her 22-year-old son, Paul, were found outside their home, both shot multiple times, according to the coroner. They were discovered by husband and father, Alec Murdoch, on their rural property 10 days ago. Alec called 911, according to police, but the call has not been made public. The murder is sending shockwaves through the local community where generations of the Murdoch family have worked as well-known lawyers and prosecutors tied to countless legal cases in the South Carolina low country. A tragic, tragic situation. The Murdoch family is well-known. Hampton County now. One where's your emergency? Hello, uh... I just going down the wrong Crockettville Road. Mm-hmm. I see somebody laying out. Somebody going to hit him. It's dark. Uh-huh. Somebody going to hit him. All right. We'll get an officer headed out that way. Okay. All right, sir. On July 8, 2015, Stephen Smith, a 19-year-old from Hampton, South Carolina, was found dead around 4 a.m. in the middle of Sandy Run Road. 
Steven's entire face was covered in blood that came from a seven and a quarter gaping hole on the right side of his forehead. His head was deformed by blunt force. His right shoulder was partially dislocated. Cuts and bruises scattered his right arm and hand. His loosely tied shoes were still on, his clothes appeared untouched, and his phone and keys were still in his pocket. Steven's massive head wound, along with lack of other significant injuries on his body, stumped investigators. It is a two-lane roadway, uh, level, sight distance not an issue. Uh, however, this collision occurred uh, approximately at night, approximately one o'clock in the morning to four o'clock. So visibility will be used with uh, headlights only. There's no other ambient lighting in the area. Investigators found Smith's car three miles away on the side of Bamberg Highway. His wallet was also inside his car. Law enforcement believes Smith ran out of gas and started walking home before he was killed due to Steven's gas cap being unscrewed and hanging outside of the gas cap door. Officials at the time were unsure of the cause or manner of death. At first, they thought it was a potential hit and run. However, South Carolina Highway Patrol officer J.L. Booker was told it appeared to be a homicide and the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also called SLED, would be taking over. There is no body trauma other than to the head area. There is some uh, scrapes and scratches on his left and right arm, on his knuckles, some across his face. It does not appear to be, in my opinion, uh, uh, struck by a vehicle. Booker would also say he was advised there was a possible gunshot wound to the victim's head. To corroborate the cause of death, the Hampton County Deputy Coroner ruled the death of a shooting homicide, noting a possible gunshot entry point on Smith's head and also a defensive wound on Smith's right arm. This new information would force investigators to search the rural Sandy Run Road. Um, as far as uh, evidence here, there is only uh, evidence of where the body was found. There is no car parts, no any type of uh, parts to a car or truck or any other vehicle. Uh, In their search, investigators from the South Carolina Highway Patrol, the Hampton County Sheriff's Office, and SLED would find virtually no evidence. No bullets, no gunshot residue, no tire marks, no debris from a vehicle. It was as if he was killed prior at a different location and then placed in the middle of the road. Another interesting observation was that Stevens' loosely tied shoes were still on his feet, contradicting the hit and run theory, seeing that his shoes would have flown off his feet from car impact. Even though the coroner at the scene ruled the death to be a homicide shooting in the state of South Carolina, a pathologist has to perform an autopsy to determine the official cause and manner of death. So, when the autopsy was conducted at the Medical University of South Carolina by Dr. Ann Presnell, without offering any evidence whatsoever to support her contention, concluded that the manner of death was listed not as a homicide, but undetermined, and the cause was ruled a hit and run. Her autopsy report concluded by saying, in light of historical information and the autopsy findings, it is the opinion of the pathologist that the descendant died as the result of blunt head trauma sustained in a motor vehicle crash in which the descendant was a pedestrian struck by a vehicle. This decision will be met with confusion and skepticism by investigators and those who knew Stephen. Todd Proctor, a multidisciplinary accident investigation team member, also known as MATE, visited Presnell at MUSC to get some sort of clarification on the Smith case. Proctor wrote that Presnell spoke in a negative tone and basically called him a liar when he said he had already spoken to Hampton County Coroner Ernie Washington. Proctor would write that he asked her why she stated his cause of death was a hit and run in her report. And her answer was because he was found in the road. She had no evidence other than that for the statement being put in the report. Proctor then explained to her that the law enforcement officers had no evidence of this individual being struck by a vehicle. To that, Presnell responded with that the report was preliminary and it was Proctor's job to figure out what was struck with him, not hers. Proctor then spoke with Kelly Green, a Hampton County deputy coroner and a sled agent who both attended the autopsy. According to reports, Green was also responsible for the transfer of evidence in the case which included Stephen's clothes, hair and fingernail clippings, and a rape kit. What's interesting is 
If the pathologist deemed Steven's death to be a hit and run, why would a rape kit and fingernail clippings be needed? Steven's friends and family also disputed the autopsy report. They knew Steven to be sharp and hyper aware of his surroundings. However, if we are to consider this a possibility, Steven would have had to be walking in the middle of a rural pitch black road, not hear a truck and or not see any headlights approaching for him to be struck. Also, according to the toxicology reports, Steven was ruled to be sober that evening. So, the story of a hit and run is not impossible, but highly improbable. In his hometown of Hampton, Stephen was beloved. Stephen Nicholas Smith was born 2 pounds, 12 ounces at 7.05 a.m. on January 29, 1996. Born a twin, his mother Sandy Smith said her son was always a bright kid. <laughs> but, yeah, and he was, he loved books. He loved his room was a library. We had to put shelves on all four walls to hold all his books. And he would not put that book down until he was finished. He wanted to be a doctor, but he said that he didn't, because it cost so much money to be a doctor, that he would start out in nursing. After he finished the nursing, he could get a job and then put himself through medical college and become a physician for needy children that doesn't have insurance. It just so happened Stephen was going to classes at Orangeburg Technical College on the night he died. Stephen was an openly gay young man in a small town, which wasn't easy, but he made the best of it. He was bright and determined to make a better life for himself. Growing up being openly gay in a small southern community would seem hard enough, but would that be motive for someone to kill him? South Carolina Highway Patrol detectives, who specialize in vehicular accident investigations, not murders, were assigned to lead the case in the interviews. Even though they rejected the claim that Stephen was killed in a hit-and-run accident and SLED usually handles homicides, they proceeded with the case. The detectives would start the interview process by speaking with Stephen's family and close uh, a friends. A bunch of people were like, I just left the house the first official time yesterday, and I went into the store, and a bunch of people kept coming up to me, and they're like, did you know the Murdoch boys are behind it? You know, saying uh, Buster Murdoch, the one we went to school with, did it, and some of his friends, and I'm just sitting here like, why? You know, it makes no sense. He's never said anything bad about Stephen. He's never been around Stephen. These interviews will begin to uncover names and details of who were rumored to be involved in Stephen's death. No lawyers have contacted you about anything happening. The day that Stephen passed away, um, Randy Murdoch was the second person to call my dad after the coroner. Randy Murdoch is the uncle of Buster and the brother of Alec Murdoch. And he said he wanted to take the case and it would be free of charge and everything. And my dad's a little iffy on that, so. Because it, it's kind of weird. No lawyer sits here and says it'll be free and you can have whatever money you want. It's interesting that he would be the second person to call the family and want to represent them pro bono, especially after discovering that Buster may be involved in some way. Corporal Duncan failed to make this connection at the time since in his post-interview notes, there is no mention of a Murdoch. Corporal Duncan will move on to interview Stephen's mother, Sandy Smith. The rumors that's going around Hampton that everybody keeps coming up to me and saying it was Murdoch boys. The Murdoch boys? Yes, whoever they are. Okay. When he would stay at my house, and he was a study person, he studied. But he would come to my house and stay there until about 1 o'clock in the morning before he would go home. Okay. So if there's something that you find out or somebody else that you feel like I need to talk to uh, that just kind of uh, uh, comes about, let me know. Okay, I sure will. All right. And, uh, and I appreciate all you do. Corporal Duncan continued to interview close friends and others who knew information. She was at church and that both of y'all had spoken about Stephen's death, about Buster uh, Maddox. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Kind of tell me what you uh, uh, told her about that. I told her that another friend of mine had texted me asking me if Buster and Stephen were together, and I told him no. I said, not that I knew of, and then I asked why. He said because he had heard that, and then I asked him who he heard it from, and he said he didn't know, he just heard it. Okay, so he didn't have any real, uh, anything to base that upon just except for a, more or less a rumor, is that correct? Do you know Stephen Smith? Yeah, he was my classmate. All right. 
And um, and did you send that text to uh? Uh, what was the text? Let me pull that up. All right. It says um, if uh, Buster Madon ever had any type of a relationship with Steven. Did, did did you send that text? Yes, sir. And then the question was asked back. Uh, uh, how did you know about that? Where are you getting that information from? It was a rumor. Rumor? Yes, sir. Just best friends. So I asked. Okay. According to the investigation file, Buster was rumored to have been linked to Stephen intimately, but detectives were never able to prove that connection. Any information that you know, do you know any information about whether that's true or not? No, not at all. Not at all? Do you know anything about Stephen's death? No, sir, not at all. No, nobody's come to you and, and brought any information to you uh, other than what uh, what the question you asked, is that correct? That's correct. Had you ever heard of uh, Stephen and Buster being involved with uh, at all before this? No, sir, I haven't. So this was the first time you'd ever heard about something like this? Yes, sir. Okay, did you know Stephen at all? Yes, sir, he was my best friend. Okay, and did you know Stephen was gay? I did. During the course of multiple interviews, the Murdoch name would be mentioned over 40 times throughout the course of the investigation. More than half of the people interviewed during the investigation told police they heard Buster Murdoch was possibly involved in Stephen's death. Detective Todd Proctor would soon take over the interview process. But I'll tell you, my office is out of uh, Charleston. Do I have no ties to Hampton? There's no big name in Hampton that, that worries me, and I want you to feel at ease about that as well, because I've heard that this name, people associated with this name have been going around kind of kind of threatening or putting the heat on people saying, you know, keep your mouth closed if you heard something, whatever. First we heard he was shot. Then we heard it was a hit and run. But recently, probably a week ago, a week and a half ago, I'd say something like that, um, I heard that these two, maybe three young men were in a vehicle. Um, they were riding down 601, saw the car on the side of the road. I guess saw the boy walking. Um, they turned back around. I guess they were attempting to, I don't want to say, you know, mess around with him or something like that and stuck something out the window and it, you know, hit him in, I don't know if it hit him in the head or the back or where it hit him. Um, and then that's pretty much all I heard. I did hear names and I'm, um, or heard a name. And that name was, he goes by Buster Murdoch. Proctor would eventually try to call Buster Murdoch. In his notes, Proctor says he didn't answer the phone and his voicemail was full. Proctor then would go on and attempt to email him. This is the only documented time in the investigation Highway Patrol would attempt to talk to Buster. Five months after Stephen's death and the case losing momentum, an article with an interview featuring Stephen's mother would get published. In that interview, she says she believes that her son was killed for being gay by several local Hampton County youths from prestigious families which she believes have sworn to protect their children no matter what heinous crime they committed. She goes on to say that she believed that Stephen would not have been walking on Sandy Run Road in the middle of the night. She didn't buy the hit and run theory at all, and she hears the same story, but from different people. She continued to say, everybody knows what happened to my son, but nobody wants to tell me who was responsible. Also in that interview, Sandy did mention other rumors she had heard regarding Stephen's death one being about an older man stalking him. In a previous interview, someone else would have mentioned this rumor as well. And uh, now let me ask you this, have, have you heard anything strange about how Steven died or any rumors or anything like that? Uh, they, what I heard was they said he was running from somebody. He said he was running in the woods from a guy, like he was running from somebody in the woods. Did you hear that from Steven's mama? No, I heard this from my classmate. Okay, all right. Did they even describe who it may have been? Yeah, they said it was the older guy he was running from. We was like, we were trying to figure out who he was running from. And we was like, maybe it was some guy he was messing with that nobody knew of. And I guess he was going to bring him out of something like that. That's what we thought. Okay. Another rumor surrounding his death was mentioned by a man claiming to be his boyfriend. He was one of the first to be interviewed at the start of the investigation. He said he was the last person on the phone with Steven that night and mentions him being harassed by men with a pickup truck. Because he already told me he was out of gas, he was running out of gas. That one of the calls before, 
and then the call dropped. And he's been harassed in this town. They've been they've been messing with his lugs on the car. They've been screwing with his battery. Um, and when you say they, who are you talking about? We don't, I don't know. The only one that he told me that he made it very clear to me, the guy with the, the tattoo. Is that where he said he felt like he was being followed? Then? Yes, he said that he was being harassed at that store. By who? He didn't say, he said it was a couple of guys in the pickup truck. A few days after the article was published, Corporal Duncan would randomly receive an anonymous tip stating, Dontario Aiken, along with another black male and a white male, Murdoch, are the ones involved in death. Duncan would send this information to Todd Proctor and would advise him about this current situation. However, it would take the Highway Patrol a few months before they followed up on this tip. What's interesting is, a few days after the interview by Sandy Smith and the anonymous tip mentioning Buster again, Corporal Duncan would receive information from a man named Daryl Williams. Williams would tell Corporal Duncan that his stepson, Patrick Wilson, told him that a man named Sean Connolly struck and killed Stephen with his truck. Williams would go on to state that the reason he was passing this information on was because Randy Murdoch told him to call. Yes, Randy Murdoch, Buster's uncle, and the man who called the Smith family moments after they found out Stephen was killed, asking them if he could take on their case pro bono. That Randy Murdoch. It's also interesting that this story fits the pathologist's hit and run theory to a T. The same theory that contains zero physical evidence of ever happening. However, Duncan would proceed to conduct interviews to follow up on this new tip. We got some information, you know, about certain things, and this was a tip that was given to us. Um, right. And I believe this come from a, is it a Darren Williams? Is that is that correct? It's, uh, it's Daryl. Daryl Williams? Okay. Yep. Can you, can you tell me what was told to you? We've tried to get in touch with Patrick, but he, you know, he's kind of avoiding the, uh, the, the call, the contact and all. Basically, Daryl called me and he said, look, he said, this is what I was told. He said, Patrick, come over here to the house. He said, he told me that Sean Connolly was drunk and hit something. He said, he went back the next day to see what it was he had hit, and he seen a lot of police out there. So he talked to one of the cops, and then he had left, and then he learned, I guess by media, that somebody had been killed in that same area. That's why the police were there. Sean called him crying, saying that that's what had happened. Okay. And then Patrick was telling Daryl, and Daryl told me that Patrick was crying, telling him, and after he got finished telling the story, he walked outside his house and threw up. Okay. Did, and did, he said, Nick, he said, Nick, he said, this is just me thinking, he said, but I think, I think that Patrick was with him. He said, why else would he throw up and get all upset like that? Because somebody else, you know, had, had done something. Right, right. After looking into this tip, According to the case files, the South Carolina Highway Patrol never attempted to contact Patrick Wilson or Sean Connolly. The case would slowly start to become cold as no progress is documented being made after this. That is, until six months later in 2016, Highway Patrol would finally follow up on the anonymous tip mentioning Dontario Aiken and Buster Murdoch. Um, can you just tell me your name, just for the record? Dontario Aiken. Okay. Tell me, what, tell me what you knew about this, about uh, what happened to Stephen. I really don't know too much about him. I mean, uh, I heard of, I was like, no, he got killed, but that was it. So I ain't never heard what really happened to him. How? How did he get killed? Somebody I know went to school with me and Facebook, social media pretty much. Really? Yeah. Who was that? Uh, who posted that stupid thing? I can't remember who posted it, but I remember seeing it on Facebook. It was on somebody's page. Now you go to Facebook and you just be scrolling. And then somebody was like, rest in peace, Steven. And I was like, Steven. And then I seen somebody had a picture of it. I was like, oh, that kid, he's down to go to school with me. That's all I know, he died. That's how I figured out, you know, he died. But they say how he died? Okay. Uh, somebody said he got hit by a car or something, man. That's what, that's what you heard? Yeah. He didn't get hit by a car. He did? Uh-huh. Uh, someone murdered him. Oh. That's what I'm saying. For what? Why would somebody do that to him? 
I have no idea. You ever go out to, to parties out in the country with some schoolmates? Well, I ain't partying in so long. It don't make no sense. You, uh, did you go to school with some kids with the last name Murdoch? It wasn't too many months. Well, it was one, but he graduated with Steve. Right. You hang out with him? No, I did. Do you have an attorney? Why would I need one? I'm just, I'm just asking. Yes. Well, here's the thing. You know, your name's been kind of brought up, you know, as link as a link in this death. So, I mean, if there's anything that you look that you want to say about it, you know, I'd, I'd hate to, to see you, see you go down with the, with whoever killed this boy. Huh? I wasn't near. Didn't nobody until later after he died. On the exit. According to the case files, this is the last time the South Carolina Highway Patrol interviewed anyone regarding the death of Stephen Smith. Besides concerted efforts from the family the following years, writing letters, hiring private investigators, etc., the case would eventually go cold. That is, until June 23rd. 2021. Maggie and Paul Murdaugh in Colleton County, they have now reopened another unsolved case from six years ago, and that is our top story tonight. Now the South Carolina Department of Law Enforcement tells WSAB that information from the Murdaugh investigation has led them to reopen Smith's case. They would not say what evidence led to that decision or whether the Murdaugh family was involved in any way. WSAB will continue to follow this developing story. SLED has since contacted and ruled out the Smith family with having any involvement with the double homicide of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. Attorney Mike Hemlet, who currently represents the Smith family, urged anyone who may know what happened to Stephen Smith to come forward. On July 17, 2022, the family of Stephen Smith gathered by his grave for an unveiling of a new headstone in his honor. Suzanne Andrews, the head of a fundraiser called Standing for Stephen, vowed to help raise money to create a new headstone for the site and cover any additional legal fees for the family, a promise she continues to follow through with. To date, no arrests have been made or suspects officially announced. And while the Smith family waits for answers and justice, SLED told reporters that the homicide investigation remains active and ongoing. If anyone knows anything, big or small, about Stephen Smith's homicide, Please, I beg you to please call Crime Stoppers and just tell us what you know. If people don't talk, then you can't stop the violence. Breaking news, another member of a prominent South Carolina family tied to a murder mystery has been shot. Good evening, I'm Amir Jenkins. Okay, what's going on? I, stop, I got a flat tire. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes. 